Hypertensive disorders of pregnancy remains a leading cause of maternal and neonatal morbidity. Would like to tell you that tomorrow morning will be a breakfast session. Uh, Prakash, can you just put that slide? Just that one slide. And the breakfast session is a free for all breakfast session where you have ovulation induction, tips and tricks of IUI and recurrent pregnancy loss. So those of you students and seniors who want to attend this program, please register now because tomorrow morning we have a limited number of seats for all of these programs and they are free. So those of you who have very interesting cases to discuss, please put that across. Just get across to the registration counter and register, please. Hypertensive disorders of pregnancy remain a leading cause of maternal and neonatal morbidity and mortality. Treatment of pregnancy-related hypertensive disorder remain a challenging problem in obstetrics. I would like to invite Dr. Girija Walk to enlighten us on recommendations and antihypertensive use during the preconceptional period and pregnancy. Dr. Girija Walk is a currently consultant at Girija Hospital, Pune. Her areas of interest are and are her high risk pregnancies. She has been an advisor to NRHM at the state level and an advisory board member. Over to you, ma'am. Good afternoon, everybody. At the outset, I want to thank Dr. Kamini Rao for giving me this uh, privilege of being here at the live conference, which is the ninth event in the series that she's done. And madam, you continue to inspire us in many ways. And thank you so much for having me to speak upon something which is very close to my heart. How do I move this further? Okay, fine. So, my task is speaking about antihypertensive use during the preconception period in pregnancy. What are the current recommendations? And we all know, and we've been hearing since yesterday, that it happens to be an important cause of maternal fetal morbidity. And what is more important, and the recent thing which has come and added to the fire, it is not only the antihypertensive medicines, but hypertension itself, which is responsible for childhood cardiometabolic disorders. And we all need to be aware of this. The majority of women with controlled chronic hypertension under appropriate management will have successful outcomes. However, pre-pregnancy hypertensive women with poorly controlled blood pressure in the first trimester will have significantly increased risk of target organ damage in both mothers and fetuses like LBWs, preeclampsia, other adverse outcomes, and the recent study which has been published in 2019, even recurrent pregnancy losses. So we have to be aware of this. The current focus, if we look at, is speaking lots about management and treatments of hypertension during pregnancy and lactation. And there is a lot of limited evidence which is applied to the management of hypertension before pregnancy, and that is where also lies our responsibility. Preeclampsia is a disorder which has taken us through generations. I can see a lot of senior practitioners in the crowd, and they must be witness to all the things that have changed. The aspirin came, the aspirin went. It again has revisited us with a lot of confusion. So this is a disease when one particular um, management protocol comes. We have containment, then there's a renewal, then there's denial, and then there's confusion once again. From the time of having a fear of eclampsia, now we have progressed to a fear of HELP syndrome, which is much more devastating, and now looking at the futuristic, not only to the mother's life, but even to the baby's future conditions. So what we have to deal in our clinical practice, if you look at what we have, is actually a continuous background music of a chronic hypertension, which is quite predominant, the gestational hypertension, late onset preeclampsia, and most of it, if you see, after 20 weeks is the time when we usually come in the picture. What happens before, we do have about 10 to 20 percent of our patients coming to us for preconceptional counseling. But that time, for some reasons, their blood pressure either may not be taken properly or may have missed our identification for various reasons. In a chronic hypertension, it's defined as blood pressure of more than 140 by 90 before pregnancy and before 20 weeks. It's commoner in older obese or black women. There's an increased risk of preeclampsia, congenital heart disease, and FGR. And there is chronic hypertension. There are higher risks of adverse outcomes. And that is what we have to deal with. So now in my next few slides, I'm going to deal with that particular component, which is before 20 weeks of gestation. 
A disorder which is known to increasingly now affect women. 3% to 5% seems to be a less figure. There's increased rate of C-sections, postpartum hemorrhage, gestational diabetes. It triples the risk of perinatal mortality over general population, doubles the risk of placental abruption. And if there is baseline proteinuria, we heard to lupus and nephritis today, it increases the risk of preterm deliveries and SGA infants. And therefore, it's probably a good practice to look at proteinuria even at the outset when the patient comes to you. Maybe we'll be able to identify certain things. And the number is rising over time along with the trend of women postponing childbirth into their 30s or 40s as well as obesity. Now if you look at the percentage of prevalence of various causes of hypertension, and this is a big googly because the commonest one is essential hypertension. But we cannot forget the rest of them because if you have the secondary hypertension due to various other reasons like the vascular causes, the drugs and so many other things, these are the ones which are really going to give rise to severe adverse morbidity. And therefore, knowing the duration of this condition, doing thorough baseline investigations, systemic evaluations of these patients and identifying comorbidities are extremely necessary. Now, the agents that are blocking production of angiotensin are found to be most effective in these patients and they are used very commonly. And these are the ACE inhibitors like captopril, enlapril, and lisinopril. And the use, however, is associated with fetal renal failure, FGRs, oligohydramnios, pulmonary hypoplasia, and fetal death. And it, they are associated with increased risk of fetal anomalies. And such adverse effects appear to occur regardless of the gestational age at which these drugs are administered. And therefore, even the ARBs, which are other ones which are known to block the action of angiotensin, they should be avoided as their mechanism of actions are similar to the ACE inhibitors and appear to have similar adverse effects. And therefore, one has to remember that in a preconceptional period, if you have an opportunity or the woman has come to you in a very early pregnancy period, care should be exercised when prescribing these ACE inhibitors for women of childbearing age as a significant proportion of pregnancies are unplanned. It should be avoided in women with chronic hypertension who are planning a pregnancy unless, of course, there are certain compelling reasons, like some women would be having diabetic nephropathy and you would then have to choose using this drug. But in such patients, it should be advised to inform her doctor the moment she becomes pregnant, we can withdraw these patients and then shift. Then shift to what? Then we have options like the alpha methyl dopa, the labetalol has been shown to have no teratogenic effect, which has been studied. And why not atenolol, which is another beta blocker? But there has been a large retrospective study of atenolol use in pregnancy, which has been found to be associated with IUGR, especially when administered in early pregnancy, because atenolol impairs fetal maternal circulation and increases uterine artery resistance index and fetal aortic pulsatility index. Evidence also suggests that beta blockers may have long-term adverse effects on very low birth weight neonates, resulting in increased neonatal mortality. So there's some more fuel to the fire of confusion. Women with chronic hypertension, either treated or not treated, are at increased risk of cultural malformations in offsprings, particularly cardiac malformations compared with normotensive women. And although it is possible that hypertension increases this risk in offspring and that antihypertensive drugs further contribute to this increase, it is also possible that hypertension and CHD share similar risk factors. Now moving on to pregnancy, in pregnancy after 20 weeks, these are the commonest things that we have and overlap and it's a, we have to play Sherlock Holmes to find out what it actually is. Gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, eclampsia, superimposed preeclampsia, chronic hypertension and most of the mystery is revealed while the patient is delivering or after she has delivered or she's landed in some sort of a complication. And what then has to be now remembered and the current mantra is 140, 90, blood pressure is not normal. And we cannot say that it is mild and then not do anything. We have to act. When hypertension is diagnosed in a pregnant woman, establishing a diagnosis, deciding the blood pressure at which treatment should be initiated, target blood pressure, avoiding drugs that may adversely affect the fetus are the mantras. So we have a patient who, as I told you as a background, pregnant women with chronic hypertension, they would be low risk. And what we have been practicing all these days Antihypertensive drugs only if severe hypertension develops. This is changing a little now. And how I'm going to be shortly sharing with you. Antihypertensive drugs, however, if you have a woman who has high risk factors, is having comorbidities, 
but then you will have to go and investigate them for them. They would not come with a label saying that I have comorbidity, so they would be having underlying problems. And these women would require to be given systolic blood pressure of below 140 and diastolic below 90 milliliters of mercury. So what is the proper protocol? Blood pressure in a pregnant mother normal is, has to be less than 140-90, and we know the mild and the severe classifications. And acute hypertensive emergency is the one where the high le level of blood pressure rise, that is 160, more than 110, lasts for a longer period of time and is associated with acute complications of HTP. But most of us will agree that in our community, we find that even 150, 100 can be taken as a severe hypertension and a crisis depending on the comorbidity that the woman presents. If you look at the ACOG 2015 committee opinion, it talks about immediately treating, introducing standardized evidence-based clinical guidelines for the management of patients with preeclampsia and eclampsia, and it has found that reduction of hypertension and stabilizing it reduces these morbidities considerably. So what do we have at hand? Of course, we have to initiate acute onset hypertension with antihypertensive medicines. We have labetalol, hydrolyzine, and nifedipine, and we have to give magnesium sulfate for seizure prophylaxis in these patients. Now, why do we need to treat this severe hypertension? Because there's a loss of cerebrovascular autoregulation, and this is a wonderful publication made by Marilyn Coppola's group, and it has been found that the cerebral vascular adaptation to pregnancy and the effect of acute hypertension, and it was found that during acute hypertension, similar to what occurs during severe preeclampsia and eclampsia, there's forced dilatation of the large cerebral arteries, which occurs decreasing vascular resistance and allowing greater transmission of hydrostatic pressure to downstream arteries and capillaries, giving rise to edema, hemorrhage, and rupture. And in a woman who is already having chronic hypertension for a long time, she could be having microaneurysms in her blood vessels, which with a little increase in the blood pressure may simply rupture and give rise to intracerebral events. And this is a publication which we must read, 2005, Stroke and Severe Preeclampsia and Eclampsia, a paradigm shift focusing on systolic blood pressure. Long time back, our senior teachers used to talk only of diastolic blood pressure, and now a lot of understanding has gone to systolic blood pressure because it has been found that this is essential because these women, what this group found was there were 28 moms with preeclampsia who suffered from stroke, and only 20% of them had diastolic blood pressure of more than 110, and more than 50% of these moms had chronic hypertension. So when and why to start antihypertensives? The Foxy Justosis Certificate course in HDP Expert Committee says, looking into all the international guidelines, 15000 would be an ideal time to start them on antihypertensives to protect against cerebrovascular accidents like eclampsia, also myocardial infarction, cardiac failure, and abruption. And these are the common drugs that we are using for urgent control. And what I would want the crowd to refer to is this revised July 2017 guideline of the ACOG, and you must print out these algorithms and put in your labor rooms and your clinics, because these are talking of how to give oral nifedipine correctly in a situation of a crisis exactly after 20 minutes, and then the labetalol algorithms, these are also there. You can just write ACOG July 2017, and it will come onto your Google, and these can be taken. And similarly, they have also added to hydrolyzing uh, algorithm. However, hydrolyzing is something which has a few reservations now in a current observation because it includes adverse effects which may mimic impending eclampsia or a syndrome characterized by hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and help. And it can cause maternal hypotension and fetal heart deceleration and a possible increased tendency to cause serious ventricular arrhythmias compared with labetalol in women with eclampsia. So we have nifedipine, labetalol, hydrolyzine, or nicotipine, and we also sometimes are tempted to use sodium nitroprusside when patients come in crisis. But it is contraindicated in the later stages of pregnancy due to possible fetal cyanide poisoning if used for more than four hours, and that has to be borne in mind. So there has to be a careful clinical evaluation of the patient presenting to you with hypertension, and then naturally the drugs to choose after the crisis has worn off is another big challenge that we have. 
The first line are methyl dopalabitalol. The second line are nifedipine, added if no response to the first line. And the drugs not to you be used, as we discussed, is the ACE inhibitors, beta blockers. And the goal should be to stabilize blood pressure to 140 by 90 milliliters of mercury and avoid hypotension. So whenever you have 150, 100, please reconfirm, hospitalize, and give them all the triage treatments and assess both the mother and the baby and take your actions. Now the question comes, what do we do in the mild and the moderate? There are very less clear maternal and fetal benefits over the relatively short duration of full-term pregnancy. Lowering maternal blood pressure decreases the placental perfusion is the challenge. And exposure of the fetus to potentially harmful effects of medications, because if you look at all antihypertensive medicines are category B drugs. So therefore, naturally, we are a little concerned. And if you look at the 2002 meta-regression analysis, specifically evaluated the effect of lowering maternal blood pressure on fetal weight, where the birth weight was slightly but significantly lowered in association with lowering MAP with antihypertensive therapy. And it was found that there was a re reduction of only 176 gra uh, grams, and this was not related to the type of hypertension or choice of medicine. So then naturally, what is there? The prudent approach is look at the comorbidities, look at the clinical symptoms, and then give. Now what is important is the current CHIPS trial, and these are two slides, and I'm going to request the organizers to give me two more minutes because I can see that I'm just having a few seconds, but these are important things that we need to know. And what this CHIPS study said was meta-analysis of RCTs of treatment versus no treatment of pregnant women with mild to moderate hypertension that randomly assigned pregnant women with hypertension to diastolic blood pressure targets of 85 or 100 and maternal treatment did not increase the risk of delivery of a small for gestational age infant or causes excess fetal risk. But they did a post hoc analysis, and this is a very important analysis which I want to share with you, that severe maternal hypertension was associated with lower infant birth weight, more preterm deliveries, preeclampsia, features of HELP syndrome, but the women randomized to less tight control who developed severe hypertension had a higher rate of serious maternal morbidity. So in the interest of the mother's health, it is important that we have a tight control. And this is another study which I would wish, I request all of you to read. And this was the tight study that they um, uh, followed, that in patients <coughs> whom they found that the diastolic blood pressure went more than 85 mils of mercury, they decided to start antihypertensive medications or revise them so that the mothers would not suffer from morbidity. So these were the various primary outcomes. Are antihypertensive drugs safe? Yes, they cross the placenta. They are category B drugs, and there are no RCTs to confirm their safety. Data regarding both comparative efficacy and improving pregnancy outcomes and fetal safety are absolutely inadequate, and therefore the uncertainty prevails. We have these many drugs. We know already, are there any newer antihypertensive medications on the horizon? None as yet. And postpartum hypertension is another new thing which is emerging, which is not the part of my task today, so I'm not dealing with it anymore. So areas of agreement, methyl dopa and labetalol are considered first choice. ACE, A, ARBs are out. And chronic hypertension is a very important to make assessment before conception to exclude all the various causes why it has happened. There is increasing debate regarding use of diuretics. There is controversy regarding use of supplements like calcium and antioxidants and low-dose aspirin. And the growing points are less restricted blood pressure goal, healthy body weight before pregnancy. And recent guidelines also encourage women with chronic hypertension to keep their dietary sodium intake low, either by reducing or substituting sodium salt before pregnancy. Now you can see that I have sort of shaken all the hornet's nest and a lot of controversies here. Thank you so much for a patient hearing and that extra time that I was given. Thank you, ma'am, for such an interesting and informative talk. So quickly moving on to the next session, the questions we will take later in the discussion okay. session. Okay. So quickly moving on to the next session, as we all know that despite state-of-the-art medical treatment,